yeah. keep it under an hour. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming. Uh, my name is Carson Tarnaski, and I'm one of the artists in residence this year at the Chester Arts Center. And I'm very happy to be included in uh, this program. Um, it's it's been warm and welcoming, even though this current circumstances with COVID and everything. And uh, actually, it's been kind of nice to have the peace and quiet and time for you know, personal reflection and, and time to focus. So I am going to talk to you today about uh, my history, my biography, basically. So I'll, I'll show you lots of pictures. I uh, have over 100 slides. And, um, but I'm going to go through some of them fast. And um, I just wanted to, to keep it interesting, basically. So, um, Let's see, starting with a kiss of water. So sculpture, I would say, is my main form of art. Uh, I've worked in stone, this marble here, clay, wood, steel, plaster, and I hail from Alberta. Um, I made a short stop over in New York before landing here in beautiful Nova Scotia. And I moved straight to Lunenburg. Um, I saw a postcard and uh, soon after booked my flight. And I love it here. Uh, it's beautiful just the nature, the community, everything. Um, I love long walks on the beach, but I'll zip back to 2012 now, which is when I attended the University of Alberta. And I studied uh, industrial design and fine arts while I was there. It was an arts degree and uh, I took the opportunity to, to learn as broadly as I could. So I was in social sciences, I took fashion design, uh, the history of art. Uh, I made things in the sculpture studio. Um, I worked with designers, I worked with uh, medical students. I had a lot of opportunities while I was there and uh, I met a lot of great people. And I just wanna say that I would not be where I am if it weren't for the people that I met along my journey. So, um, and who really would be, right? So I just wanna always be thankful and just like I'm thankful to be where I am right now. Um, this piece here, this is made out of plaster entirely. And uh, this was back when I hadn't uh, made any sculpture, basically. This was one of my first few and the class that I was in was uh, it was a it was just sculpture fundamentals. So it was about getting your hands into material, starting to make things, uh, learning about uh, formal principles, and trying to get beyond um, the obvious and move into something that was was making it uh, possible to to communicate beyond the literal and. Uh, using metaphors, physical metaphors though, the physical kind of physical metaphors that are made up of shapes, lines, forms, volumes, and stuff like that. What is PowerPoint on the screen? Oh yeah. Sorry. But he might think that we are using that's all right. <laughs> if actually that's a good point. If anyone does want to ask a question, you can just unmute yourself and interrupt me because I'm I'm so happy to hear what anyone thinks and it's always exciting when someone has a question because uh, I know that something was interesting or confusing. <laughs> but um, so this sculpture in particular, it was, uh, the idea was, could you make a sculpture that held the audience's attention for 12 seconds or more? But um, 
recent studies show that people only look at uh, paintings and galleries for 12 seconds. So that's, as an artist, all the time you get sometimes, maybe even less if it's on Instagram now, right? So how do you make, how do you make it worth someone's while? This sculpture, you could put a marble in it and it would roll down and through like a ski hill and get to the bottom and I timed it and it was exactly 12 seconds. Um, the great thing about being in a university setting is that you get to expand into new realms um, and take risks. So this was a collaborative sculpture I did and we were uh, trying to confront the theme of could we make the grotesque beautiful? You know, looking at this, you know, I'm even grossed out. And I thought, oh, geez, I made that. But um, the song Strange Fruit by Nina Simone, grotesque and beautiful. Um, some of the most memorable experiences can come out of uh, being confronted uh, initially with confusion. And when we're in that situation, um, you know, we're caught between making sense and making believe. So this, it was uh, in Epcor Tower actually. And um, if anyone ever thinks about uh, taking a risk and doing something that maybe they're not so confident in, well, I wasn't confident in this, but this was part of a group show of students and um, it was in Epcor Tower, which was owned by, you know, one of the big wig uh, oil, oil barons of Alberta. And it just sort of taught me that if you, if you believe in yourself and you, know, you give yourself uh, leeway, um, other people will inevitably get on board with you. And I found that most, most of the time people just wanna see you doing what you, know, what you wanna be doing. So that was a good experience. Um, other things that I explored was memorializing something that's very close to us. It's our clothing. So um, we wear clothing every day, but do we ever think about it? Um, Pablo Neruda wrote poems about uh, clothing and there's something special there, I think, because it's how we choose our clothes. Um, it's part of our identity, but also our individual spirit. So I was trying to make sculptures that would be you know, bringing up the idea of what is lasting and what is left behind. I worked in portraiture, creating someone's likeness. But I, as I said, I was also in design, so we came up with concepts. This one, a, uh, a drum stand for Japanese taiko drumming, which is a t traditional style of drumming. And uh, as you may be able to see, I was bringing in a sculptural influence into um, a design context. And another group project, we ended up making something that was a piece of furniture that was empathetic to um, the physical gesture that the drummers use when they, when they make the music. It's almost like a form of dance. Furniture design was something that I did and all of the projects we did in design were uh, group projects because it's important to to be able to collaborate too and that was part of the education the the project was to um, design an outdoor seating an outdoor bench and we ended up taking that a little bit further and it happened to be winter at the time so we gave the bench walls and windows and a roof and a door and it became a building so became a sort of a modern warming hut. Here's a close up. So uh, I'm no stranger to taking risks and it was a, it was a fun thing to try, uh, especially when you have a, a group all on board with the same idea. Halfway through my degree, I had the chance to go to the US and uh, do a artist internship program at a great place, which was Franconia Sculpture Park. It's totally a community run center and uh, it's the grounds for 
sculptural exploration and it's a it's a, a roadside attraction with giant crazy things and um, there's a lot happening there they cast their own iron they do an iron pour they bring in artists from all around the world um, and it's basically an incubator a place for people to try out new ideas you know learn about themselves take risks um, and just really develop as artists what i did when i was there was make this sculpture and um, I want to talk later about uh, traditional skills but where that where that was coming from was that my grandfather had recently passed away and I wanted to make a memorial sculpture to him and I wanted to use the language of sculpture and the method of sculpture to do that so these skills that I was learning and communicating through form and symbolism and abstract uh, means, I, I applied that to a personal situation. And um, I was thinking about, you know, what is permanent and what's ephemeral? Um, and could I make something that's like a, a relic from the not so distant past, something that looks maybe from another world, but is really close to us? It had an inside and there was a door on the side that you can get yourself in there. And I wanted it to be a place for contemplation and self-reflection. It was set on the side of a small pond with reeds and cattails. And there was a beam across the water where you could, if you were adventurous enough, uh, traverse and look through um, a piece of natural wood into the inside. And from the inside looking out, this is what you had. I was interested in the light that shone to, into the interior, um, thinking about in which ways do we as people emanate and in which ways do we absorb. And again, thinking about the influence that others have on us and the influence that those who have left us have on us. Um, I tried to use the light as a way to symbolize um, family members. It gave me a chance to um, communicate with the public. They would lead tours and schools would come in along the, along the way. So it was a really good chance to, well, just meet people, talk and just expand. Uh, one thing I want to say is they really prized um, self-reliance and individual effort there. Um, they, they had cranes, they had big machinery there that they could have moved anything with, but just the kind of people that were there and the kind of energy that was going around, we just decided to lift it up and move it. This was someone else's sculpture that they built. Um, skipping ahead, I... I graduated with a Bachelor of Design and uh, I had the chance to go to the Banff Center where I did a year long internship. Um, it introduced me to a lot of different uh, art forms, uh, ceramics, printmaking, uh, letterpress, and bronze casting, welding, brazing, blacksmithing, mold making and woodworking. And so it was a really good supplement to uh, the degree that I had and it allowed me to get more into art and more into sculpture and as well meet a lot of uh, other artists. Um, from there, I was lucky enough to um, be invited to be part of a really, uh, a really cool workshop uh, in Italy. So uh, again, a United States organization called the Digital Stone Project was putting on a uh, educational workshop for students and professional artists to travel to Italy and use new cutting edge technology to do something that is from the ancient past, which is carve things out of rock, marble in this case. Um, a few years ago, the government uh, 
um, in this part of Italy decided as a, as a way to uh, vitalize or revitalize um, the, the economy and the local business there and uh, a local quarry, they would, they, would, uh, they would start a facility with advanced technology and robots where they could produce sculptures and complex architectural details. Um, and through that, um, the Digital Stone Project was able to collaborate with them and put on this workshop. Um, this is James Carl, a notable artist who happened to be there at the same time. Um, he was good fun. He was the only other Canadian there when I was there. But since then, a bunch of um, artists from Edmonton have attended um, and uh, it's really taking off now. We worked outdoors, uh, it was beautiful. I got a chance to have a, a working holiday. So I feel really lucky about that. Um, my piece was uh, quite voluptuous in form. Uh, this is just the, ro the robot that carved, carved them out. And after they were roughed out, um, I went on with hand tools and I finished the forms and I, I shaped it and I, I got it how I wanted it. Um, and we worked for a month on this. In the end, uh, this is what I came up with. And the title is Pillow and it's a sculpture about the feeling of softness or embrace. And I gave it the name Pillow just to be cute. Here's another look at it. I was really fortunate uh, at the end of the, uh, the workshop, uh, the mayor of the town uh, decided to choose uh, one of the sculptures uh, to be on display publicly. So um, they happened to choose mine and um, it's been there for three or four years now uh, in a beautiful setting uh, with my name on it. So I feel really honored about that. And since then, every year they've been uh, doing the same for other artists, uh, emerging artists starting their career. Um, a sculpture I made after that was along a similar vein, I try to sort of make, at this time anyways, I was trying to make sculptures that were about feelings, you know. I know that we all have feelings or some feelings that there's no words to put to them. They're just, um, they're just things that you can feel, but you can't really, um, there's no other way to get them out except art, is there? So some people have music, um, some people paint, and I was making sculpture. So this one I called Linger and it had a, a sensual theme to it and it was about uh, kissing. Um, and it went on the next year to be made in marble. And this is the quarry that that marble came from. And that's the mountain that the quarry is in. After that, I ended up going to New York because I was offered a job using the skills in design that I had. So I worked for a prominent uh, uh, stone masonry uh, company uh, that outfitted buildings with um, moldings and stone features and floors and cladding and things like that. And they did some of the nicest houses and the Hamptons and New York. So I was uh, again, lucky to be, to be brought there. And I got the chance to, um, to be challenged and to learn new skills and, and uh, design furniture um, and see it uh, fabricated in the shop. I got to, I got to 3D model architectural details and uh, design uh, a really large stone mantle and fireplace to be to be produced in limestone and I, I did other things like tackle the problem of how do you uh, figure out how to cut stone from book, book matched slabs in such a way that the resulting arch looks like this where all the striations line up so that was the kind of thing they did there and it was it was really interesting work um, even uh, showing someone how their kitchen countertops would look before 
they were even cut out um, so that they could see and make their decision based on that. Um, and again, this company was using some of the same technology that I had just used in Italy to make sculpture. And um, I was lucky to be able to travel to the job site sometimes and see sites like this, but I was tired of seeing sites like this. And I was, uh, I was antsy to start working outside of the box um, after, after doing this for some time, which is when I moved to Lunenburg. Um, the reason was that I wanted to start getting back into uh, traditional knowledge and learn some traditional skills. Um, kind of, it's sort of where my roots began in carpentry and whatnot. And I had always sort of uh, fantasize about being a boat builder. I had looked at wooden boat magazine. And I thought, wow, that's that's a lot cooler than framing houses. Although there's nothing wrong with framing houses, that's cool too. But I'm someone who likes curves, as you might see in my work. So I just I just packed up and I moved straight to Lindenburg and I got a job working down on uh, down on the docks basically. And I I landed in a place that hadn't changed in over a hundred years. Uh, the Lunenburg Foundry is actually an older company than BMW, if I'm not wrong. It's like 125 years old. And some of the equipment in there, I'm sure is just as old. They cast things out of bronze, which is something I was interested in. And I looked around and I found beauty in, in the functional things as well. So it was it was interesting too, and I was I was just happy to be working with my hands again, um, and I took my chances to be creative where I could. I restored old patterns that were really craft objects uh, made out of wood, uh, taking them from this and repainting them and finishing them to look like this, and uh, I tried to leave my mark where I could. Some of the things in boat building are quite sculptural too. I learned how to varnish things and I got a chance to work on a really fancy fine yacht that sails around Nova Scotia. Learned about rigging, hull repair, painting, and I did some sailing. Um, also uh, traditional mortise and tenon carpentry and shed building. This is just a uh, random picture of blue rocks just because, because it's beautiful. And uh, it reminds me of why I moved here. Um, this is a stone sculpture. So this is some recent work that I did leading up to the residency. Um, and there's gonna be more information on this coming out, but it's for a, a local site and it's a, a commission that uh, that sort of honors the local flora and fauna of the region and it's uh, done in relief on uh, local rocks uh, that are limestone it has the, uh, the english name of the animal and the Mi'kmaq name which is the indigenous name those are the stones before and those are after. Uh, this is a process basically I did uh, to arrive at the finished product, a sketch and then a example in clay. And just to run you through quick to give you a sneak peek behind the curtain. Um, this is me uh, tracing out the outline on a, on a flattened stone and then carving that in uh, to some depth. Uh, this is called uh, sunk relief. So there, this isn't the only form of relief sculpture, but this is the kind that I was doing just because it was the simplest. And then more details. And finally, something like this. Um, after that, and directly before the residency started, I made this sculpture 
which was for an outdoor sculpture festival in uh, Ontario. And uh, I titled this Stone Forest because at the time I was fascinated by the, the land formations in China, which are called the Stone Forest and they're, they're limestone and they're formed with thousands and thousands of years of rain eroding the rock. And I just thought, what if you could walk through that, you know? And um, there's nothing new under the sun. But here were some of my initial sketches and then I moved to something more like this. I made a paper model and then, you know, drawing from my uh, background in design, I took all the pieces, flattened them out, um, traced them into the computer program so that I could cut them out in plywood. And then I would assemble it, uh, sand it, smooth it out, shape it, and uh, finally figure out how to join that back together. So it was quite the puzzle, but it was a, it was a fun problem to tackle. And this is where it is now. So um, this is the Alorta Sculpture Project. And um, I can't exactly remember, I think it started in 2010 and the funding for it is provided by local businesses and the uh, art loving residents of the area. And um, they, they just basically curate an outdoor sculpture festival every year, uh, you know, as a way to get people out walking the town and, and seeing beautiful art and hopefully, um, you know, creating opportunities for emerging artists to sell works and to start their career. So here I am now uh, in Chester and some of the things that I've been working on are uh, wood carving in nature. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to try something that I never tried before. And again, I just wanna say that that's very humbling because it's easy to keep doing what you're already used to and you kind of feel like, oh, I'm good at this. I can get even better. But when you start with something that you haven't done before, uh, it's like, wow, this is not as easy as it looks. And, uh, uh, but in the end, uh, I think it's worth it because you come out uh, with that much broader of a scope. And that's kind of been my style ever since I, I started in university. So this is just basic um, chip carving that I do in basswood with a knife. And that's, that's my second one. So I'm not showing you my first one. There, there's a reason for that. <laughs> uh, this is another exploration. Again, you know, I want to bring curves into my work. Uh, here are some of my sketches. Uh, and I'm, I'm a lover of old things. So, you know, like I, when I pass an old piece of driftwood or an old tree or a stump or something, that, you know, that inspires me. And I, I think, how can that be sculpture? And uh, when you zoom in to bark, you know, or if you zoom into a plant or a rock or something, you know, there are really interesting textures in there. And I think, you know, I'm not gonna take credit for saying this, but uh, Eugene uh, Delacroix said that you as artists, um, if you know there's something new, reveal that to others in a way that they may have overlooked. And I'm, I mean, that's, that's all I think an artist needs to do. You know? So again, on that same theme, some explorations that I have been doing in my studio practice. And I was seeing these as kind of sentinels or protectors, um, which is kind of how I see trees when I pass them in the forest. And could I make a sculpture inspired by the coastline or the, the mountainscape or the, the land that's local to us? Thinking of uh, a recent trip I went on to, uh, the Cape Breton Highlands recently. Um, and how could I bring in digital technology to augment what I'm doing? Um, these are, this is made in a computer program, but why I like working this way is that you can try out ideas without ever getting your hands dirty. Um, not that, you know, you need to do both. You need to get your hands dirty too, but uh, when you do it in, in this way, um, it maybe opens up possibilities that you didn't see before. And maybe it, it sort of 
uh, jolts your imagination or it makes you see something that you might not have arrived at if you were just working with the uh, same old familiar uh, materials and techniques. So um, I like to I like to change it up like that. And I'd like to make a sculpture um, that's based on something like this while I'm at the Chester residency. Um, just another picture here. Holy cow. So they say it's good to end with a punctuation mark. So here's my exclamation point. And that's the end of my, of my presentation. That was 106 slides. I can't believe it. So I hope, I hope you enjoyed that. And I'm really uh, interested to hear any questions or any comments or anything that you have. So now it's your 